A lot of them upload it from to YouTube or some or, or or anywhere. Oh, I, I'm not sure how that uh, how that works again. I think we just put it on the website on the social. Okay, network. okay, not YouTube. Okay, which is good, <laughs> which is bad. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yes, um, welcome everybody to today's uh, reading Soda Labs reading group. Um, today we have uh, Rachel presenting a really cool NLP, uh, political science NLP project. Ideas have consequences: the impact of law and economics on American justice. So. Rachel, the floor is yours. <laughs> Given that uh, we only have four of us here today, we can be really relaxed, right? There's no, uh, yeah, we can just. Uh, We're uh, already uh, eight by now. It's, it's that? pumping. <laughs> yeah, it's very, it's a, it's now a very comfy setup. Okay, uh, so why I choose this paper? So it's a, it's technically an NLP paper, but you can see if you have read the paper. It only has uh, one, like out of the four outcome variables, only one of them is actually an NLP outcome. So I choose this paper mostly because I'm very interested in this general question, the, the, the very big puzzle about judicial decision making in general and uh, the potential of NLP technology to address this puzzle. Um, so I think this is just one example that NLP has been applied quite successfully uh, in solving a piece of the, uh, a part of the puzzle. Okay. So what is a puzzle? The puzzle is that it's very hard to understand what, what judges are doing, like why they act in their specific way. The reason is because, so here's a very nice quote from Richard Posner. Um, so at the heart of economic analysis of law is a mystery that is also an embarrassment how to explain judicial behavior in economic terms um, with um, when almost the whole thrust of the rules governing the compensation and um, other terms and the condition of judicial employment is to divorce judicial action from incentives. So basically judges basically face no incentives. Uh, they have life tenure the their wage is essentially fixed and they have very little probability very small probability of promotion especially for federal judges um, so their next step is to become justices on the supreme court that's almost impossible yeah with only nine of them there uh, and one from uh, probably one promotion opportunity every five years i suppose for the entire ju uh, federal judiciary system yeah so so this is a this is like a, some something that has puzzled economists for a very long time. Like, what do judges do, and why they act the way they act? Because the economists believe that everyone responds to incentives. There's, if there's some incentives on judges, why why the judiciary system seems to work in in general quite well? So I think that's a general umbrella um, topic, and I find very interesting. Um, for this paper. We can also see, uh, we can also motivate the research question um, basically by saying that because there's zero external incentive on judges, um, unlike politicians who have to worry about reelection and uh, other things, the judges, they have absolutely no external incentive. That means that the internal motivation really matters for judges. So what the think the best normatively really appealing for the for themselves and for the society now become really the dominant concern okay. so that's why if you can shape judges normative judgment it's probably even more powerful than shaping the normative judgment of other players uh -huh. in the political system um so also another reason why judges may be influenced by these ideas um normative ideas uh, more than other players is that they have to interpret and apply laws um, under significant uncertainty. So, um, so in common law systems, the judges, um, their judgment will become the case law in the future. So the future judges have to f follow the, the, this, this uh, ruling decisions. So essentially those um, um, current judges who are making the decision uh, they are essentially legislators, and uh, they are just uh, they, they cannot trace out the, all the consequences of their 
Ethereum. Um, so they have to apply uh, quick, quick way of thinking heuristics to basically make this kind of quick uh, decisions relatively quickly. This is especially the case because federal judiciary have a really high workload. As we're going to see, they have about uh, 67,000 cases each year they have to make decisions about. And only 100 of them actually make the Supreme Court. So 99% of the decisions are actually final and will become the law in the future. Yeah. Um, so this creates a lot of scoops, uh, scopes for school of thinking um, defined as a system of ideas and normative commitment, um, which form basis for policy. So basically why, um, so according to, to the three authors, why law and economics can be so powerful is because it creates a very uh, clear conceptual framework for judges to predict the consequences of their decisions. So they will say, if I make this um, judgment, then um, it will minimize the cost of uh, criminal deterrence. And uh, that's very desirable. And uh, because law and economics is a very narrow uh, economic framework, that uh, makes the cost minimization problem really salient and then the judges just to focus their attention on this because they have to make so many decisions in such a time span and this helps them to speed up their decision making process etc. So the paper in a nutshell is basically just trying to quantify the impact on judging of a novel and actively promoted legal theory, law and economics. We're going to have a, a quick discussion about this, uh, this legal theory in a minute. So basically, they use uh, two quasi-experiment variations. The first one is um, the major variation they're using, which is this Man Economics Institute for Federal Judge. It's a very intense two to three week training program of federal judges uh, funded by a lot of large corporate donors um, taught by some of the most prominent economists in the country. Okay. And uh, the exposure to, um, to this program is staggered, so that creates um, scope for difference and difference and uh, event study. And they also harness some of the institutional structure of the U.S. federal courts. Okay. I think just the institutional setup of this paper is already uh, quite rich and uh, just, I feel like I learned a lot about the judicial system too, by just reading the paper, yeah. Uh, okay, so, okay, so, um, one slide on the U.S. federal court system. So this is a, this is a very powerful institution, probably um, because in the U.S., I think the judicial system is more influential than uh, judicial system in any other countries. And this is basically the last step before the Supreme Court. So um, <clears throat> as we have just discussed, the, because it's a common law country, they are not just interpreting the laws um, made by the legislature, they actually set up new uh, rules and legal distinctions that future cases must follow. So these uh, this, uh, federal judges are appointed for life. There are, there are 179 of them in the 12th um, circuit. So here's a map of the, all the 12th circuit here. Um, um, and also 678 district judges in 94 districts. So if you zoom in, you can see some of the, uh, the more populous states, they actually have a few more districts. Like California has north, northern, eastern, central, southern, yeah. Um, and their workload is, is quite crazy, I think. Like they have, the district level has to um, deal with 327,000 cases. And uh, the circuit level, so 179 of them, they have to deal with 67,000 cases each year. And the Supreme Court, the workload is much lighter, but I still think it's crazy. It's 100 cases per year. And nine of the justices, they have to basically dis decide on a then decision every four days, right? So, of course, they have a team of clerk, clerks behind them, but still, yeah. Um, and because uh, only a tiny fraction actually made to the Supreme Court more than 99% of the circuit decisions are final, and they comprise the vast majority of what law students are reading. 
uh, in the country. Okay. Uh, any question here or anything you guys want to discuss? So uh, just an overview of the results. Uh, the paper basically find that after uh, the federal judges attend this program, this man economics training program, and it has a massive impact on many different dimensions. Um, so the uh, attendance significantly increased their use of economic language in their decision. Um, so they are more likely to give out conservative verdicts in economics relevant cases uh, as compared to non-economic ones. Uh, the attendan uh, attendance also increased the likelihood to rule against the regulatory agencies. In particular, the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, and the National Labor Relations Board, NARP, NARB. So the Environmental Protection um, Agency and the Labor Rights Protection Agency. Also, uh, attendance of the man training program is as associated with harsher prison sentence um, uh, imposed. So we're going to discuss why attending economics, law and economics will make the judges more harsh on uh, criminal offense, but uh, it turns out to be quite intuitive. So this is a direct impact of attending the program, but there's also significant spillovers. So if you have never attended the program, but a few years ago, you were on a panel to um, judge a case with another colleague who used to attend this program probably a few years ago, then that actually also impacts your decision. Okay, so this is severe over effect, the peer effect. So uh, I, I don't think I have time to discuss this, so I don't have slides on this, but it's all, it's a, it's a last section of this uh, very rich paper. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, so yeah, uh, the literature, I didn't put any paper here, but I think uh, um, what interests me most um, is its uh, implication for the constitutional constraints on to policy making. So it's because tradi the traditional thinking that judicial independence is very good, is something that is almost universally appealing. Um, this paper basically shows that if we insulate the judges from everything, then paradoxically, we are easy to capture on some other dimensions. It's easy to influence them if you can change, if you, if you can somehow influence the ideology, because now you, they don't care about the external incentives. It's easier if you can do something about their internal normative judgment. Okay, so, okay, so that's basically the introduction part, and now uh, just the background of the program and the law and economics. Any, any, anything discussed here? Uh, so the law and economics moment uh, is something, uh, um, I think we, we all have some exposure to it because it's all covered a bit, little bit in introductory economics, the cost theorem mostly. But I think it, if my understanding is correct, the overarching principle of this way of, uh, um, um, sorry, uh, law philosophy is basically, um, judicial decisions should aim at minimizing social cost or maximizing economic efficiency. Okay. So um, because of this, um, it's naturally quite uh, pro-business and uh, anti-regulation, anti-environmental regulation, anti-labor anti rights regulation. Um, so um, among its many implications is that law and economics, they criticize regulatory policies for the presumed perverse unintended economic consequences. The idea that is that if you um, impose really harsh environmental regulation, you don't really know what are the potential, uh, potentially disastrous economic consequences. If you impose really harsh liberal rights regulation, there might be mass unemployment that you couldn't uh, predict today. Um, and how that uh, uh, economic principle to minimize cost or maximize efficiency, how does that translate into criminal uh, judgment, uh, cr criminal, criminal judgment? It's basically all based on this uh, very simple idea uh, that Gary Baker talked about in his um, very famous article 
on crime and punishment. So for Gary Baker, he basically argued that the optimal punishment for every, any criminal offense is to hand the criminal with probability zero. Okay. So you probably have heard of this in some other context. But, because, but why this is the optimal punishment? Because it has a very strong deterrence effect. So even though I will be caught with probability zero, the punishment is huge. It's like an infinitely large punishment. So the size of the sanction is infinity. So even though the probability of detection is almost zero, the expected sanction is still really high, it's still really, like, really large. And more importantly, it's also, um, it, it is also very um, um, cost efficient, right? So because you're only going to hand the criminal with probability zero, it doesn't impose a lot of um, stress on, on the fiscal system to actually uh, punish the criminals because that will only happen with very tiny probability. So this is considered to be the best way to punish criminals. So you, you, you almost never, you will almost never be able to catch them, but when you catch them, you should all send them, send them to death, basically. Um, so that's probably the most extreme version, but uh, a more practical implication of this kind of analysis is just that uh, in criminal case, um, judges should be really harsh and that, will, that should be able to create a really strong deterrence effect. Okay, so this is uh, two minutes on the law and economics, not really doing justice to this very rich uh, tradition. Uh, so the main program in, in law and, and, and economics is basically just, uh, uh, um, it's like a summer school for federal judges. Um, two to three weeks, uh, ran continuously from 1976 to 1998 and 1999 to present. So it's still going on actually. So to my, to my surprise when I was reading the paper, it's still going on. And uh, at its high day, uh, its uh, heyday, it's actually taught by all the big names we, we all know. And uh, the, the syllabus looks a bit like uh, introductory e economics, supply and demand, um, and, uh, with uh, more emphasis on its in implication for uh, jurisprudence. And um, quite um, strikingly, by 1990, 40% of the sitting federal judges have had attended. Probably because, also because the, the the size of, there are, not, there are not many federal judges anyway. So when they are running it annually, yeah, eventually they enroll 40% of the sitting federal judges. So this is uh, the share of um, cases that had at least one judges that used to be um, trained in this man program. Okay. And you can see just uh, 1977, there are already almost 20% so one year after it's <laughs> it start, almost there are almost twenty percent of the cases that have at least one judge that used to be on this program. Okay, so anything you want to discuss here? Okay. Uh, this is even quieter than my undergrad unit. Mm. Okay, <laughs> so here are a few very uh, like. Uh, I would say like uh, disturbing slides from the MBR presentation. Um, they didn't have it. Uh, they didn't uh, put it, put some of it in the in the paper. But here's some really disturbing things. The first is that this program is really funded by large corporate donors. So it's from Washington Post, and uh, um, you can see some of the uh, gosh, yeah, like Unilever. I, I I can't even recognize many of the firms here. Share, etc. So it's really a movement um, sponsored by all these large corporations. So here's here are some photos of this program in real action. So this is a uh, 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 Friedman Nobel laureate Friedman teaching the federal judges. So you can see from the beginning the judges deferred to their teachers. So this, uh, the, the federal judges are some of the most powerful and smartest persons in the country, right? But they are still quite deferred to their teachers because probably because these teachers are Nobel Prize winners and yeah, such high prestige anyway, yeah. Uh, and this is, uh, this is class in session 
uh, students getting reading, reading assignment for the evening from the director. So I have to find this is so, so funny. It's like, it's like probably an imperfect analogy would be like uh, Puerto Bureau members in China uh, doing assignments uh, from professors. Yeah. Being taught by you, Vajia. <laughs> yeah. Also, it's like, yeah, looking into a class ball probably for years. <laughs> <laughs> and here is uh, the news, uh, newspaper article about this program. For three weeks, 19 federal judges took a grueling six day a week course in economics. And the class started at 9 a.m. and sometimes any at 10 p.m. or later. Um, and the judges receive the equivalents of a full semester at the college level. And even though some judges are over 60 years old, they behave like students. Um, yeah. Right, John? Yeah. Now it comes a question, but maybe similar to your undergraduate students, I might have missed something because, yeah, um, I'm, I've not paid enough attention. The, now, when you said with the, so, you know, the, in 1989 or even before that economics i guess and the things that were taught even in law and or especially in law and economics are different from what it is now right now i i see law and economics as sort of an mainly not mainly but like empirically driven there's theory but there's so there's still some ideology but it's way more now at ideology agnostic and really says let's let the theory and the empirics talk whereby during that time you know it matters whether you know you have Friedman up there talking or someone else that uh so is is that a bit of the goal of the paper uh, so, that, so there are two things the first thing is to uh, if you teach judges law and economics, you can just, you know, present them about results that are um, at least from the onset I, free of ideology or papers, sorry, papers. And then there might be results that are, you know, catered to your political attitude. Mm. And um, my the point I'm trying to get is that uh, the ideology part of the curricula might have been way higher in the past than it is now. And so the question now is whether this is sort of a bit of the goal of this paper. Uh, I think definitely. And uh, given that it's almost like, a, so this is a syllabi from 1989, right? Mm -hmm. And it looks very, very um, old fashioned. It's a, uh, 1980 introductory economics with almost zero empirical papers on it. Yeah. Um, and also the supply, like a very like a simple supply demand analysis without, without much um, like uh, even additional concerns um, that we nowadays all, all have in this kind of analysis. Okay. Uh, so yeah, it's it's like you know, what happens if you um, um, if you teach only the simplest, I would say, yeah, the the earliest version of introductory economics. To to they they actually have a lot of discussion about this because uh, although most of these uh, econ uh, teachers, these um, tutors, they are probably from more conservative ideologies. There are like Paul Samuelson is, is here, but uh, the question is why Paul Samuelson himself is, seems to not be super influential in, in, in this mm -hmm. uh, thing at all. So there's a lot of discussion on this, in this, uh, in the, in this paper actually. Okay. Yeah, but uh, you can see, uh, there's a few quotes here, which uh, shows quite a disturbing ideology bias. Um, so here, yeah. So this is from the MBER slide, which they don't put there. Yeah, there's some of them in their paper, but for example, uh, yeah, for example, here it says, when insider trader, insider, insiders trade on their information, they make the market more efficient. 
uh, for all the rhetoric about the unfairness of inside trading, its operational effect is to make the stock market a fair game than it otherwise would be. Uh, unequal punishment is equal crime uh, of equal crime uh, is desirable because discrimination and punishment can be analyzed in terms of economic efficiency yeah. and uh, things like that. Yeah. So they also actually have some interviews of the judges who actually attend this unit and showing that it does change their mind uh, sometimes. Yeah. yeah, here's some more quotes. I'm trying to change your view of the world to show that what you thought was bad really may not be. And uh, yeah, things like this. And this is a classical price theory argument here, right? Give me a capsule that magically clean all the air in Los Angeles back me to crush it. I won't crash with capsule because if I do, poor blacks will have to pay $20 more for land rental. That's very pure price theory analysis. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, I think it's also given the time constraint, it's like you have to be selective in your material and they can only cover the basics, I suppose. Yeah. Cool. So now uh, that's the background of this, uh, this program. So uh, now come to the real analysis part. So they construct uh, first um, a data set of, uh, to measure the economic style in judicial language. The first uh, thing they look at is an index of law and economics phrase used by this, uh, this scholar, Alexson. It's basically nine, nine phrases, uh, externality, transaction cost, efficiency, et cetera. Okay. So these are the most salient phrases used by law and economics um, scholars. And they have two measures of economic styles in judicial language. The first one is just the average frequency of these phrases per opinion. So that's a very simple dictionary based on, uh, measurement. The second one is, uh, looks very sophisticated. So I don't, they, they also didn't explain everything in the paper. In the MBR slide, they have much more content on how they actually construct the, the measurement. So it's, it seems to, to try to harness as in much information as possible from the from each case so they want to assign for each word a measure of how close it is to the law and economics rhetoric so for each word in the document so they are trying to do it to map the word to a vector space and the case is measured as the average of the vectors for each word in that case weighted by the inverse frequency of each word. So words that appear very rarely, but indecisively, they are considered to be really important. So uh, I, I didn't do the analysis, so I, I, I don't want to, do, to, to not do enough justice to their very sophisticated uh, construction. So I will just give the intuition here. If, but I find the MBR slides really useful if you want to, to check them out about what they're doing. So here uh, is basically the word cloud list of the set of words that flow listed to the average word vectors for this nine phrases. So we have, uh, it's, uh, it's not surprising that uh, the most uh, important words are like efficiency, deterrence, productivity, et cetera. Uh, okay, so here's just a, some summary statistics uh, they have three measures of uh, uh, law and economics language in judicial opinion. Um, we can see for the first measure, um, we have on the horizontal axis years before and after attendance of the MAM program. On the vertical axis, we have effect of Alexson Law Econ Language Index. You can see the attendance of the program seem to be predictive of imploring of a more economic language in judicial opinion. So that's a simple uh, dictionary based measure. And the so sophisticated measure, you can also see detect upper trend, but this is not an event study framework anymore. It's just the time series of, the, of, the, uh, of this trend of using economic language. The last one is, is um, it's just uh, checking those small uh, this measure based on tax analysis with a very intuitive measure. 
which is cases that cite uh, Judge Richard Bosnow, the prominent law and economic scholar and judge. Um, you can see, um, because I think he, he became a, a federal judge in 1981, so you can see there's, already, there's a huge increase um, of uh, cases that cite Richard Posner and it actually uh, stabilized around 12, 13% uh, even recent, recently. <clears throat> Okay, so um, so that's uh, one measure of one um, one outcome they, they care about, which is how how much economic language the judges will employ. The second more substantive outcome is just the judicial decision. This is something we care even more about. Um, so they have this database of five percent of circuit circuit cases, uh, and the, this five percent sample will hand labeled for ideology, whether the opinion is liberal, conservative, or neutral, or hard to code. And they also complement this hand-coded data set with a machine-coded network. Um, so here is the summary statistics of the data. We can see there seem to be a quite drastic uh, increase in conservativeness uh, in economic uh, opinion, or in economic cases, as contrast to uh, a basically a flat um, pattern for non-economic cases. Okay. okay, so basically now, after they have prepared this very sophisticated data, they can run some regression with it. Uh, um, so the main regression they run is the causal, so they want to estimate the causal effect of assignment of judge J on case I in curve C and year T. Okay. And they have four outcome variables here. First one is the, the use of economic style language. Um, they, they just constructed uh, either the very simple frequency of the law and economics phrase or the more sophisticated vector embedding uh, measure of uh, law and economic language. The second outcome is the conservative versus liberal vote in the hand coded sample. The third one is the voting against government in regulatory cases against EPA and NLRB. And the last one is the length of criminal sentence in the district court. Okay. And the key uh, treatment variable is just uh, basically um, uh, it's a dummy variable. It, it, it equals to one after judge attends the man program, and it equals to zero otherwise. Okay, so of course we mostly care about this gamma here. Uh, in terms of the control variables, they have the full set of judge fixed effects and uh, the circuit year interacted fixed effects, and they have also have uh, quite a lot of judge characteristics, including some measure of judge ideology interacted with years and because the treatment is essentially assigned at the judge level it's attendance of the man program for each judge so the standard error is clustered at the judge level um, so they report all the regression results um, in the table for this regression for the graphs for the figures they report the event study regression result so we can look at the dynamic pattern of, uh, of attend, uh, what happens after a few years you attend the man program. Okay. Any question here? Or? Yeah, I think the, the, the regression, the um, framework is very straightforward. I think the, yeah. most of the, uh, uh, quite sophisticated construction is here and actually also uh, yeah yeah I think nobody wants to be that guy on Twitter usually on Twitter right that now jumps in with staggered treatment and so on already so, yeah I wonder like uh, and like oh oh did you look at did you do the Baker decomposition and did she use the St. Anna um, correction yeah. and whatnot? So that's, that's what I wonder. Cool. Like nowadays, how, how do you guys like uh, walk? Given that there are probably five new papers on on econometrics of event study and difference in difference. 
every week. <laughs> um, yeah. You you pick up maybe one one or two once in a while, and then just hope that once you submit it, you expect that the referees will for sure come up with one of these, and just hope that um, it's not a sufficient reason for them to reject you for not doing one of the you know twenty or fifty new things that came out. <laughs> between you finishing the working paper and submitting it. Oh gosh, that's stressful. <laughs> and that abstracts from all the like five synthetic control paper that come out like with some machine learning synthetic control oh, yes. that come out parallel to that to the whole thing. So yeah. It's fun to be an applied economist, I guess. Yeah well I wonder like what, what are you guys doing with your paper the the yeah, the environmental activism paper. It seems to be we, yeah <laughs> i started coding stuff so like i think like it's like the inferences have been complicated but i have a feeling we will put it out of the uh, of the draw at some point when a referee will jump at us for it <laughs> yeah yeah like yeah, you do what a referee wants first yeah definitely i think it will drive people crazy if this also happens in in economic theory where a new solution concept is invented every month and we have to solve the game all around again um, every time, every month, basically. <laughs> okay, so uh, this is a this is a very cool result. Um, uh, they somehow first um, present this result, which is the attendance of the man program and ruling against uh, uh, labor and in all environmental agencies. So we have um, on the sorry. On the um, horizontal axis, we have again, it's an event study, so it's years before and after man attendance. On the vertical axis, we have the effect of voting against labor and environmental um, uh, agencies. And we can see um, the pre trend seem, seems okay. I don't know whether, like, uh, people, whether it's pre trend is okay. I think it's is actually the 1 million new applied econometrics papers about, right? But I think it looks okay to me. But you can see after you attend the MAM program, uh, you are much more likely to rule against uh, um, labor or environmental agencies. Just, just a question here, Wage. I was wondering, um, I'm not, I, I just scanned the paper, so I'm not like sure, like did they give, do they give an explanation why they, put like labor and environmental agencies into one bucket because I think like right if you get a conservative view taught on like labor economics right like then you would expect this kind of like probably like um, effect but if you hear anything about externalities and I think like there might be have been some on the docket that would have brought that issue up you would maybe expect that for environmental issues you would maybe think more about like since they hopefully are taught externalities that that might actually change their opinion in the other way so i'm like uh, like this kind of uh binning here like i was like just intuitively didn't make sense to me i mean i don't know like if you have an explanation because i would think that they go probably like given the curriculum probably actually the uh, like opposite directions rather than in the same direction but yeah, they actually cover externalities, uh, I think, in the, yeah. in the 1989 syllabus. Uh, but they also cite from uh, Martin Fjordestam, which, um, so, like, who is one of the uh, professors teaching the unit and who is quite su suspicious of all the externality argument. Um, but I, I, I totally agree, like, the, the liberal, policy on labor unions seem to be based on really different mechanism as compared to more liberal uh, policy on environmental protection. So mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe they're just uh, trying to boost the significant, make uh, the... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe, yeah, maybe they yeah, like... Because yeah. if you only, like, uh, there are not a lot of labor cases, all environmental cases maybe, you have to, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, sure. Maybe it's, it's yeah. like a uh, piece of a p hacking kind it's of kind of landmark, especially labor cases. I think uh, environment. Yeah, like you, that might be. Yeah, but the referees, I, I, I'm confident we ask them the same question. Yeah, yeah. So this is a regression form, which is not an event study regression. It's a very simple. Uh, it's this one. Uh, so it's just it, the average effect. Yeah, it's thing. just a, because this is a dummy. Uh, like it equals to one if the if the judge receives um, has received uh, the man program training in any. Yeah, it's like I, I suspect there's a term limit, right? On on. Like, or how long? No, is it not? Or, uh, no, no, I mean, the Supreme Court, no. But is it on the district? No, no the federal judges also have life tenure. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, it was just like because of the average effect, right? If it like stays constant or one, I was just like, right, it differs how fast, like to be harsh, how fast the, the judges die a bit, right? Like, yeah, but they, they are the going average. to. Yeah, so that, that makes me wonder why the, like, if I'm the, sponsor of this uh, this program i would want to train judges in their when they are 40 years old but they also train a lot of um 70 years old judges or something like that but yeah they have life tenure because these are federal judges yeah i think this system i'm, I'm not a law scholar at all so i don't i i always consume sorry confuse me intensely like uh, some of the judges seem to be elected but that's more like at the um at the um, state level or less lower than state level, but the federal judges seem to be appoint first. App they are appointed by the president, and second, they have life tenure. Yeah. So yeah, it's like it, as it, we expected, they are all ex very significant results at one percent level, and uh, very robust to control variables. And you can see if anything after adding more control variables, the point estimator actually becomes slightly larger, which is very good news for them. Uh, and what next? Well, yeah, also I just realized that my question is answered in the notes. Observations are weighted to treat judge years equally. So I think that means that probably is what they try to address here. But yeah, like, yeah. Some yeah. have like 25 years and the other one is 70 and then just yeah, 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 five, yeah. five years later. Or yeah, otherwise you couldn't probably have this amount of observations. Yeah. yeah. What's this? Oh yeah, this is a ruling against the IRS, which yeah, which uh, immediately back to your pri previous question, why they bundle the uh and the RB and EPA together, but treat uh, the IRS as a separate um, uh, category, the, the Internal Revenue Service, the, the, the taxation bureau in, in America. So they have a very similar finding that um, after you attend the MAN program, you're more likely to do against the Internal Revenue Service in favor of uh, the taxpayers. So this, this part I find really intuitive, right? Because if you have taken introductory economics, like uh, tax is something you, you, you don't want to impose on the economy because of the debt with laws. And uh, if you can, you always want to avoid it. And uh, it's not, not really surprising. Uh, and uh, in the regression form, we can see the result is um, still quite significant. And again, if they include all the fixed effects, the point estimator actually become larger, which is again, quite reassuring. This figure confused me a lot. Um, I don't know whether you guys read it carefully. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so I, I think the vertical axis is a measure of how conservative the vote is. And I just wonder whether the color is, should be flipped. So yes, uh, yeah, you would expect so, right? Yeah, because they insist that um, the ruling on the non-econ case become much more conservative. But the, uh, sorry, the ruling of the econ case become much more conservative, so the score should increase. And uh, the ruling of non-econ case 
there's not a significant trend, but if anything, it becomes a slightly less conservative. So if that's the case, I, I wonder whether the, the, the color should be flipped. Yeah. But it's a, it's a, as the paper said, it's an it's a incomplete draft. It's a, uh, yeah, this, this, is a, this is a figure that confused me quite intensely. So, yeah. but shouldn't then be the, if I understand it correctly, when they say econ cases, that's an aggregate of some of the results we saw previously. You know, previously you showed us results for judging on environmental and labor regulation. Mm. And I assume that's now a subset of what they think of conservative vote. Also, uh, this measure is based on the, the hand coded. Uh, it's like a, the result, like that, the measure here is a very clear result whether the ruling is against the IRS. Which is a conservative, is that yeah, a conservative? It's, a, it's probably highly correlated with the yeah. measure here. Here so, is the hand coded uh, measure of whether the opinion is positive, is conservative or liberal, yeah. I mean, you were right, like the first graph showed us, right? Like there was just the raw data where it showed us that the conservative vote yeah. for econ cases went up like at the beginning. Yeah, this one. Right? So like it doesn't make intuitively sense. I'm just wondering like, do you remember? I don't recall what regulation here means because it's like not labor regulation itself because now they have the bucket regulation and labor for economics cases, which is different to labor and, and environmental, but I was wondering what actually falls under regulation. I mean, that seems like an extremely broad. Yeah, like uh, for, for environmental agencies, it's easy to see what's going on, but for labor, I agree. Like I'm not, uh, it's, it's a very broad category topic. Like, uh, yeah, also the IRS cases, I would be interested maybe like what, this means, I mean, there's this fat, like this quite like, famous tweet once uh, that um, I think ProRepublica also created like a, like a map about where the IRS actually audits the most. And it's usually in the poor black uh, counties and not, uh, and there's almost no auditing in um, New York, for instance, which is quite hilarious or like in the Hamptons. That doesn't make any fiscal sense, right? <laughs> it, may, it makes absolutely like I, I, I've once thought I was like, well, it would be fun to like do a back of the envelope calculation, how much money the US loses every year by this kind of strategy of the IRS. But, mm -hmm. um, but no, I was just wondering, right? Like because this kind of auditing is so weird that it is, act, if you can interpret cases against, like ruled against the uh, IRS, even as point. conservative. So that, was my, that was my point because I'm not, I would still say the cases that are broad or like the poor um, audited black citizen probably won't bring it all the way up to the district court. So I would still expect <laughs> those cases that go that high up and the people that have oh, that gosh. much money um, would still be the, the big shots that then, so that's why I think probably the conservative thing still holds. But um, yeah, uh, um, but that's, I think, a, that's, a, that's a very nice critique, I, I think. Yeah, uh, I, I think in general, I but, think, but, but definitely, I think if you have reached the circuit level, it's probably not failing to pay $500, right? Probably a quite substantive case. Yeah. And, yeah, I uh, think yeah. for labor, that probably goes a bit as well, probably. Mm -hmm. right? like, but Oh, it will, so it will be really interesting to, 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 to give us a sense of the cases there, like instead of just, yeah, coding it as liberal or conservative, yeah. But Rajya, just to understand, and because of your confusion, is the purpose of that graph and the previous graph that they want to show that these lectures not only had an effect on how people now evaluate econ cases, which are directly linked to the lecture, but it also made them more conservative in their general judgment. Is that what- so their, their argument is that because it's the, the general uh, judicial philosophy of law and economics is more libertarian. So in economic cases, it's very clearly conservative, but in social policy, it might be it's unclear. Slightly liberal. It might be slightly liberal if you think about it. Okay. Like, yeah. uh, uh, gender. But they didn't find that actually. So they, they didn't find it. In, in the text, they say if there's anything, uh, training 
under man program seem to make the judge slightly less conservative. Doesn't, yeah, but the, the poll, right? Like that kind of. Yeah, I, I don't didn't see it in the figure, by the way. Yeah, that's the thing. I just wonder whether the color code is, should be flipped. Basically. But if they say in the text, right, that it, yeah. like, it makes them slightly less conservative, then I guess this is right, but this kind of like jeopardizes a bit all the results they... That's for the social policy, like uh, uh, identity-based poli um, uh, politics, etc. Uh, but for the economic cases, you have asserted it's very strong uh, effect on con uh, being conservative. But um, I wonder if the, the color should be flipped. I, I mean, it has if to. If the color is flipped, I think it makes more sense to me. But I checked the MBR slides, it's the same figure, so I wonder whether I, there's some subtlety here I don't understand, yeah. I personally don't understand. <laughs> yeah, this is something that I got really confused. And this is the regression form of the previous figure, supposedly. So and I guess that, like, I mean, there won't be, like, there are so many, there are three authors, I think. Like, yeah, because these are all super smart people. I, I, like, I, somebody my, would have my assumption, it. Yeah, my, my assumption is always, these are the, some of the smartest empirical guys it must be me who didn't understand some subtleties here. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so this is the key coefficient you want to look at, which is the interaction between income case and post-man training. And you can see the conservative score increases. So if you are on an econ case and you have been trained by man, you are more likely to do in a conservative way. Um, so this section has a lot of uh, back of envelope calculation, I think. But eventually, I think this is really interesting. They say that taken together, these numbers imply that the MAN program accounts for 28 to 42 percent of the rise in judicial conservatism. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I don't know whether the number should be take, taken very seriously, but this is one of the big puzzles. I think in general, like the, 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 the general trend for the judiciary to turn conservative since the 70s and 80s. Yeah. Mm. Oh, this is uh, <coughs> the man attendance and the economic style language. It's probably very clear result that um, after the training of this program, you are, the judge is more likely to employ economic arguments, uh, especially in the style of law and economics, either, either in the simple uh, frequency measure or the fancy vector embed embedding measure. Yeah. Mm. And the last panel is just uh, some additional adjustments, I think. Um, officially, we have five minutes left. Um, so I was just wondering, like, how, how many I slides? I think that's, is that the last slide? Oh, yeah. I think I only have two slides now. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, they also look at the criminal cases, right? So that's the, the, the idea that if you are trained by uh, by like Gary Baker, you want to hand the criminal who is probably zero. So if you see a criminal, you will hand him or her. Yeah. Um, that's what we kind of see here, but it's very noisy because the data, the, the, the sample is, is smaller, is much smaller. So the, the pre trend is, is quite puzzling, but we do see that after you um, attend the program, you're more likely to give a prison sentence at all, and you're more likely to give a longer, uh, longer sentence yeah. to, to the offender. <laughs> Quite disturbing, I would say, because then they relate this to the massive buildup of prisons in America since the 80s. Uh, of course, when the judges rule more harshly, then you have to find places to accommodate all these prisoners, and, uh, et cetera. And the last slide is just uh, they are trying to strengthen this result by exploring another natural experiment, kind of, um, which is um, um, so there's a Supreme case, a Supreme Court case in 2005, I think, uh, which relaxed the constraint on judges in terms of their discretion on criminal cases. So after 2005, judges are more. Um, have more freedom in criminal case uh, decision, uh, decision. So what they saw is that before 2005, the 
man judges and the non-man judges, the rule quite similar. There's some trend, but they're very similar to each other. But after 2005, when the judges have more flexibility in imposing their own opinion and decisions, the man judges are uh, harsher in, in uh, criminal cases than the non-man judges. And that's, that's it. There's also a short section on spillovers, but that involves a lot of additional notation in the regression. And uh, estimation of spillover effect are always very messy, so I need to discuss a lot more about how we do it. So I think it's better to, to, to just end here. Yeah. Thanks so much, Major. Yeah, sure, David. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, just um, one, one thing. Um, that I'm not sure, like what kind of criminal federal, like what kind of criminal cases lie in front of the district? Are those mainly tax fraud or, or because I would like, I think right the, the what kind what what like the heterogeneity among those cases might be quite large again, right? Like to understand again this like conservative story. I mean like. I guess why the theory would and told <laughs> yeah, yeah. Becker was so like would would kind of like obviously have an effect. I was just wondering, right? Like again, the 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 underlying cases because I'm I'm just I guess oblivious a bit to the like I'm to a, how I'm the a, federal like juridical system works in the US. I'm as oblivious as I mean I'm probably more oblivious to this than you. Um, I think. Uh, I think I, I, I present this paper partially for the reason I'm always very puzzled by the judiciary system at all. And uh, um, yeah, the criminal cases that can make it to circuit level. Wow, that's, that's quite some criminal cases, right? Yes, uh, uh, <laughs> right, like you, would, like you would think this is such like a selected, like, like it's oh. such like a specific kind of case that would make it all the way up there, either it's really, yeah. yeah. So we have, do we have an in-house uh, law scholar today? No. <laughs> What's no, yeah. Sadly not, yeah, I also yeah. looked. I think she would have jumped in already and like angrily with our discussion about the law system so far. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah. Well, I think in general, I, I want to present this paper because like in political economy, the judiciary is always so important in the background. Right, like uh, the rule of law, the constitutional constraint, the North one gust argument on constitutional government. Uh, but still, in most, more, most papers and models, it's taken as exogenous, and uh, the judges are just most of the time judging quite impartially. It's quite uh, like an uncomfortable black box in those models, and I want to know a bit more about what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. I'm also in a very steep learning